Hello, everyone, and welcome to GW Coders. We're the last one for the spring 2023 um, semester. So um, don't really have any announcements. We're almost to the end, so there aren't really any trainings or anything coming up. I did want to make mention for anyone watching um, that you can email me if you're interested, but the Spring Festival of Animation um, which Dr. Ock runs out of C's, which does multimedia development, AR, VR, student graphics type of presentations. Um, if you want to get into some of their virtual reality things that students have been developing, they do a festival of animation every spring. It's going to be on May 5th this year. Um, it'll be in person, though, I think they also have a large online element for experiencing the VR components in the AR components. Um, and so that's May 5th at five o'clock. Um, and they're meeting on B1 level of the SEH building at five. But then again, if you get in touch, I believe that off of the website, there will be virtual components that you can attend if you're not on campus. Um, no other real announcements from GW Coders. Um, we'll figure out our schedule for the fall and if we're doing any events over the summer and post those to Slack. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mike, who's then I um, talk with us today about some of the cool things that he's up to. So that's all you, Mike. All right. What's up, everyone? How's it going? I think, uh, so I dropped an agenda in the GW Coder Slack and I'll just use that to help keep me organized. So I'm gonna go into screen share mode. I'll give a brief overview of my presentation topic and then we'll get into it. So going into screen share mode, hopefully folks can see my screen. And so I dropped this agenda in Slack. Basically uh, my presentation today is titled adventures in dimensionality reduction. And so I'll be showcasing two different applications, real world applications of machine learning. The first is called hashtag semantic mapping project. And um, basically we're using dimensionality reduction and clustering to determine which hashtags on Twitter are most similar to each other. And this is based on co-occurrence of hashtags in user profiles. And I'll talk to you more about the details. And social media companies can use methods showcased in this project for disinformation content moderation purposes, as well as general hashtag recommendation, hashtag similarity um, purposes. And so um, you'll see some links here to slides and source code and a results site for that project. And I'll be uh, interested to take you through some of that stuff. And I'll spend, hope to spend about 20 minutes on the first project and anyone can jump in at any time with questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, and then we'll transition into the second project, which I'm calling Artist Similarity Mapping. And here we're gonna use dimensionality reduction on audio data from YouTube to determine which artists are most similar to each other. And that will be actually based on the actual audio qualities. So the, the song qualities themselves. And music platforms like Spotify can use these methods for artist recommendation purposes. And so um, I'm sharing a number of links here as well to some slides and code and I would like to spend a lot of time in this methods demo notebook to get a working version of some Python code and uh, also to share that with you. So that's a high level overview of the agenda. Um, any questions before we get into the first project? All right. Here. None, none here in the room. All right, let's do it. So I I'm just gonna start in the slides here. And I would invite you to join me or just follow along on my screen. So here we go. All right, so this first project is about 
hashtag similarity mapping. And um, in some previous research, I had been uh, focusing on collecting a data set from Twitter related to the first Trump impeachment and the discussion about that uh, political event. And so we collected around 67 million tweets about that topic, including uh, the, uh, from 3.6 million users. So um, in a previous research paper, I had collected this data on Twitter about that political event um, and it, it wrote a previous paper about it where we focus on the um, impact of automated accounts known as bots and spreading disinformation in that conversation. And so if anybody's interested in checking out that paper, you'll see a link here, but I'm here to talk to you about uh, an extension to this project that uh, has not been included in that paper, an extension that I did here at GW. And so uh, previously we did some sentiment classification as well for that project. Basically for any given tweet, we classified the pro or anti-Trump sentiment. And so um, if anybody's interested in that previous research, you could check out a link to a website, but I'd like to talk to you about some new stuff not included in a past research project. So when, I was analyzing this political data set and looking at the top hashtags that were used in that conversation. Um, we could see um, political hashtags related to the Trump campaign. And so, but then we also see these other hashtags, which we might not be familiar with if, if we haven't seen them before. They're a little obscure. Like one of these hashtags is WWG1, WGA. What does that even mean? <laughs> How would we know what that means? Um, and so um, another one though is QAnon. And so maybe some folks have heard of QAnon as a conspiracy theory or disinformation campaign. And so, um, this first project focuses on how could we use unsupervised machine learning methods to tell which hashtags are similar to, for example, QAnon, if we know about this QAnon hashtag representing um, a, some kind of disinformation or conspiracy theory, how could we, in an unsupervised way, uh, learn about similar hashtags so that we could monitor them and so social media platforms can um, leverage these methods for content moderation if they know about this QAnon hashtag and want to do some moderation for that, um, how could we find some similar hashtags? And we'll find out that this WWG1WGA is similar to the QAnon hashtag, but let's see how we could do that. So just in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip forward a little bit here and some of the background. But um, the inspiration for getting started with this project came from a related paper by some researchers in Japan who took a data set of COVID-19 related discussion and took a look at different QAnon related hashtags in that discussion. And a really cool thing that they did was to plot these hashtags on a two-dimensional plane. And so what this allows us to do is see, well, which hashtags are kind of grouped similar to each other. And based on the, this, the, uh, the, the distance on this map, we can kind of see which hashtags are more closely related to each other from like a semantic sense, like which kind of mean the same or in another, in another method, which are used uh, similarly, like used together. So I was inspired by this other research paper, and I set off to make a 2D mapping of hashtags in the impeachment data set that I had collected. And so here we go. So I'll talk to you about the methods involved in producing such a two-dimensional um, mapping of hashtag similarity. The first step is one hot encoding. And so um, basically, when I collected this data on from Twitter, we we collected the actual tweet texts that were um, 
about the impeachment, but also for any user who tweeted about the impeachment discussion, we also collected their user profile. And so what we were then able to do is um, keep track of which users used which hashtags in their profile over the course of the collection event. And so um, by storing this data in a relational database and doing a quick grouping query, we can arrive at this table on the left, which is a row per user per hashtag that they used in their user profile. So the first set, step in this kind of process is um, just getting a unique list of users and the tags that they used. And so these, this list that I used was hashtags from user profiles, but you could very well do this with hashtags used like in actual tweets. I chose hashtags and user profiles because I thought that they'd be a stronger signal of a user's um, a sentiment. And so, um, so we start with this table of hashtags that were used in each user profile. So we have a row per user ID per hashtag in a relational database. And so what we now do is perform one hot encoding to transform this raw data into a, 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 an encoding version of the data. And so with this one hot encoding, we end up with a row per unique hashtag and a column per unique user. And all the values are zero, except for if a user used that hashtag, then the value is one. So this one hot encoding shows us which users use which hashtags. Any questions so far? All right. I Feel have a good question. Yeah, go for it. Because I don't use Twitter, I guess, that much. So do people change their profile hashtags routinely? Yes. Or is this something like you set it when you create your account? Yes, a user can change their profile at any time. And so we collected data over a, a multi-month span and Anytime a user tweeted, we got whatever version of their profile was there at that time. And so what I did to kind of aggregate this was I took all of the different profiles for a given user and um, assembled a unique list of the hashtags used. And so, so basically this represents any hashtag that was in a user profile during any time in that collection period. Got so it. Yep. Cool, cool. Thanks, I appreciate the questions. So uh, so yeah, we wind up with these one hot encodings and this is kind of like the trick to this. So once we have these one hot encodings of the hashtags and the users, the second step is to perform dimensionality reduction. And so dimensionality reduction is an unsupervised learning technique where um, the model will try to pick out patterns in the underlying data. And so um, we choose the number of dimensions to reduce to, and then we wind up with however many columns uh, we chose. So if we choose two dimensions, for example, we will wind up with two columns for each hashtag. And these values try to represent the, the larger overall data. Although there's some loss of information, hopefully the, the reduced embeddings capture the essence of the raw data. And so if we choose two components, we could plot these embeddings now on a two-dimensional plane. Or if we choose three components, we could plot them on a three-dimensional plane. And so um, some dimensionality reduction methods, uh, one popular one is PCA, principal component analysis. That's what most people might be familiar with. Although I explored two additional methods in this project, one was TSNE and the other was UMAP. And they're just different versions of dimensionality reduction methods. Um, questions about dimensionality reduction? I'll talk about this a little more though. One quick question. Um, the more dimensions do you have, do you, I, I guess the fewer dimensions you have, you're reducing the amount of information with each one. Yeah, yeah. So okay. if you if you if you have more dimensions, it, it will explain more of the original data, but less dimensions, I think, will explain less of it. 
Um, but the benefit of shrinking down to two or three, a small number of dimensions, is just for our human brains to view this stuff on a plot. All right. Perfect. Cool. So now that we have the embeddings in reduced space, we can then plot those on a graph and try to visually see which ones are next to each other. And so that, that's like an informal way of viewing the similarity between hashtags. But what we can then do is perform another unsupervised method called clustering on these points to explicitly um, figure out which ones belong together. So uh, those are the steps, those are the methods involved in this first project. So let's see some results. I mentioned there's a number of different dimensionality reduction techniques and PCA is the most popular one but I tried each one of these dimensionality reduction techniques and we'll see the results for each. So <laughs> this is the results using PCA and they don't look too good. We don't see much separation of the hashtags. And so I didn't really like these results. So that's why I chose to explore a different dimensionality reduction method. So next up was TSNE. And so maybe it's doing a little better, but still not very good. There's um, a lot big cluster of the hashtags and they're not getting differentiated. So uh, this method wasn't really doing the best here. There might be some parameters that could be tuned, but um, we'll see that the next method that we use is a lot better. So the last, the third and final method for dimensionality reduction was using this method called UMAP. And so as soon as I used UMAP, it pr produced these results. And I think this is exactly what I was looking for. So what you see here are the hashtags um, reduced by the UMAP method and plotted on a graph. And I just gave it kind of my own custom color scale here. But what we see is that <clears throat> hopefully you could start to see like in this top region are all the pro-Trump hashtags like uh, campaign slogans up here on the top right, First Amendment and Second Amendment and the NRA and all that good stuff. So kind of conservative topics about being a conservative and a Christian and and backing the police and all these kind of campaign slogans from Trump. And so it's cool to see these in a cluster as opposed to the progressive hashtags on the bottom left like um, resist or um, vote blue no matter who or never Trump or some kind of uh, like Black Lives Matter. These are more progressive and anti-Trump hashtags. So it's cool to see that these unsupervised methods can differentiate between these hashtags and help us determine their similarity. So um, this was kind of the, the main result from this project. Um, Mike, one point, it might just be naive of me, but if you go back a slide to those ones that were like not so great, I'm wondering if if a lot of that is actually here, but it's just zoomed out because you have such large numbers on the axes, you know, like the other ones are sort of more close together, but this one, if you took out those outlier ones and you zoomed down on the plot, like would you get a similar looking cluster or is it just I actually can't tell because now I'm seeing like resist is in the top left and vote blue is in the bottom right. So maybe they aren't mapping very well. There isn't as consistent a grouping here, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're just kind of jumbled all in there. Yeah. And well, I mean, I'm now I'm really curious about like, what is the difference between these methods? You know, why is one performing better than the other? But um, you'd have to get into the weeds of those algorithms to figure out what's, how are they working? But um yeah, yeah. So I think PCA specifically is more affected by outliers. I believe that I believe that these are some uh, ways to contrast these methods, whereas the other ones may be less, uh, excuse me, more robust to outliers, but less interpretable or explainable. So whereas we're in PCA, we have some measures to explain what's happening with these other methods. They may be less explainable, but they might perform better on complex data especially if the data might not be like linearly separable. 
Yeah. I'm also wondering if there's just scaling differences that like MAGA was used so much more, like just the, the raw count of that was so high that yeah. that might be affecting you. You can see the size of the bubbles here that like there was a few particular hashtags that, and those ones that might be throwing them off because they're sort of outliers, but in this one, it's, it's, per, it's balanced more. I mean, yeah. 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 I think that that could be the case. Okay, cool. All right. So one yeah, this one more question. Oh, Wait, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so can I understand this? The like PCA is more um, unbiased or or more lenient, so that for example, Manga is so far away because it's really far away. But you map you mentioned is less. Um, uh, <laughs> what, what is the word you use? Can you go back to the to the explanation type? Yeah, yeah, less interpretable. I, so is it because UMAP is biased? So no matter how far away a specific point is, it will still scale down to a relatively closer way. Is that is that true? Um, I would have to take that question offline. I think I don't <laughs> want to make anything up. Um, so so I think there's more that I could understand as well about the differences between these methods. And I guess one more quick question on this. Well, in terms of coding, I mean, are you just basically changing which method applies, like one line of code each, each of these, or did you have to, do they take your data in a different way, I guess? Or is it just as simple, you run one, run another, run another? Yeah, yeah you just, it, it's a very similar process for all these different methods um let's see do i have a notebook link i think i have a notebook link uh basically it's it's very similar okay um, you just choose a different model okay i just wasn't sure if you had to rework the data each time to if they wanted different inputs in no i believe i believe you could pass it the same kind of data it's it's that data that was in as long as it's in the the one hot encoded format uh then we could just pass it to whatever dimensionality reduction model we're using okay thanks yeah and so for other recommender systems like if you had articles or something you could like one hot encode the articles and and the users who shared them um, I think that might be of interest um, based on your recommender system that you you were working on yeah exactly yeah all right cool so I think that's all I wanted to talk about on this first project but I just want to see if there's any other questions before we move on. So this one up till now, like this stuff isn't in that first paper you said, right? This is correct. A sort of exploration that you started. Yep. This I did um, last semester right, right, for my exactly. machine learning class project. Oh, okay. So you're using this for the project, just building on the data that you've already collected for the previous paper, but saying, I'm going to use it a different way to look for these these categorizations of these, these clusterings, I should say, of these hashtags. Exactly, yeah. It was something that I hadn't looked at before and is not included in the first paper. Some new stuff, maybe to consider for dissertation content. But I'm, but I'm also thinking, though, about, like, what does it imply that these are clustered together? Because embedded in this data is the hashtags, but also, also the users. So it's saying that, like, is it saying that these users are more similar? And, like, is there a network effect going on here where because you're clustered in the same direction <clears throat> or the same area, you're saying the people who use that yes. hashtag are more like each other? Is, is that the interpretation? I'm not sure. Yeah, so the way that the way that I interpret this is because we assembled those one hot encodings based on similarities in co-occurrences of hashtags and user profiles, what it means is that if these hashtags are near each other, it means that they were co-occurring a lot in user profiles. So a user would use like this and like both of these terms together in their profile. But yeah. if if they're very far away, it's very unlikely that a user was using them together at the same time in their profile. So, so it, it essentially captures like a user sentiment almost. Yeah. Oh, so what is that WWG1 thing? <laughs> yeah. it's not close to QAnon. I'm guessing it's part of QAnon in some way. Yeah, so it's like a call to arms for oh. QAnon supporters. And it means where we go one, we go all. And so it's like, <laughs> hey, let's go storm the Capitol. Let's do oh, it. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a call to go storm. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs>
All right. Okay. All right, cool. So that was fun. Thanks for engaging on that first project. Now I'd like to transition into the second project, which has similar methods, but different applications. And the methods aren't exactly the same. Um, in this next project, artist similarity mapping, instead of doing the similarity based on co-occurrence, like we did for the hashtags, which depends on how users are using the platform, that, that first that first project we just looked at was very dependent on, well, which users are using which hashtags together. However, in this next project, artist similarity mapping, we're going to do the dimensionality reduction, but based on the actual qualities of the audio itself, which I think is super cool and I'm excited to share with you. So I'll get started with a presentation, but I'd like to spend some time in this demo notebook. And if anybody is interested in running this notebook, you can make a copy of it and it should be pretty packaged up for you to explore and it will showcase these methods. But I want to talk to you about the methods first briefly. So here we go. Second presentation. I just changed the color theme on the slides. All right, here we go. <laughs> Google slides. For the it's way. different, I promise. Okay. So this project, um, machine learning for music, um, subtitle artist similarity mapping via dimensionality reduction. So the goal here, or kind of the inspiration is, we know that um, there's a lot of emerging technologies that are fusing artificial intelligence in music. For example, like this new Spotify AI DJ. And models are even generating their own music. And so um, I was inspired by these new developments in this space. And I set out to see if I could determine which artists are most similar to each other based on the qualities of their songs. So the goals are similar to the last project. We're just going to try to produce a two-dimensional mapping of artists now. And so we'll see, well, which artists are similar to each other. All right, so methods for this project, we have to get some audio data from somewhere. And um, there is a benchmark music data set called GTZAN, which I also experimented with and, and started playing with. But I really wanted to use some like real artists, some real data. So um, I chose to get the audio data from YouTube using this Python package called PyTube, which not only allows us to see descriptive information about the videos, like their title, number of downloads and stuff like that, but also we can download the actual video stream or audio stream for the video in a programmatic way. And so we'll see this when we jump over into the notebook. But basically, I assembled a list of video URLs. It was very manually assembled and not the most scalable yet, but I just wanted to assemble a training data set that we could explore with. So for a number of video URLs, we obtained the raw audio file in MP4 format from YouTube. And so now we've assembled this training data set of audio files representing a variety of artists. And so we tried to do around seven to 10 songs per artist. I would like to do more, but the YouTube downloading is, it took a lot of retries to, to actually get it to work. So it was kind of like a slow and not very reliable process. So we're kind of limited in a little bit in our data collection. Uh, but anyway, we end up with around seven to 10 songs per artist. And this I think is okay. Uh, questions before we move on? So How many getting, artists? What'd you say? How many artists? Yeah, so I have, I should have put this. So here we have uh, 24 artists, and this is the contents of the, the training set. So we have between 20 to 60 minutes of total audio length per artist. Obviously, I think more would be better, but just a little constrained in the collection effort. And we have over 15 hours of audio uh, from 206 videos total. Miles Davis, his songs are really long. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Frank Sinatra was really short. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, those are the quick, quick, short, little happy tunes. And Miles Davis, man, he would just go on forever. Lots of jamming. Amazing solo work, yeah. 
All right. So now that we've got that data set of audio features, those every song, like we were just commenting on, every song is a different length. And in order to kind of do the next step, we actually need to cut the audio into equal length segments. So there's a Python package called Librosa, which we could use to extract the raw audio signal as an actual like array of values. And so the different tracks will have different array lengths, but we can take the same segment of each array. So for example, we can choose a track length of like three seconds or 30 seconds and break up the original audio file into um, tracks, what I'm calling tracks of that smaller length. And so as you would imagine, this doesn't like three seconds or 30 seconds doesn't go evenly into any video. So there is a remainder. And so what I chose to do is discard the, the final remainder uh, left over after we cut tracks of equal lengths. That remainder will be like the finale of the song. So we're like losing the finale. So maybe that's losing some kind of important part of the song. And maybe a more methodologically sound way to do this would be like drop a random um variable segment instead of the last segment but anyway uh in this step we're just cutting the tracks of equal length and th that's important because the next step uh, we'll need the tracks to be an equal length so we could form the data set properly so once we have these tracks of equal length whether it's like three seconds or 30 seconds we could also use the labrosa package to extract the raw audio features of these files. And so I think that's really cool. And I honestly don't know a lot about how it works, but essentially we get to choose a number of features that the Labrosa package can, can extract. And one example, like a simple example of such a feature would be like the tempo of the song. There's some kind of musical, uh, sorry, numeric value for the tempo. And there's other features like that, but the most important features are called MFCCs, MEL frequency, sepstral coefficients, whatever that means is basically, we get to choose the number of coefficients to represent each song as. And the internet says somewhere in between eight and 20 is like a good number of coefficients to use. And so the number of MFCCs that we choose actually um, gives us a variable length or kind of uh, the number of columns in this in this resulting data set depends on the number of MFCCs we choose. So in addition to having a, like a column to denote the tempo of each track, we also have a column for each MFCC, one, two, three, and so on until the number of MFCCs that we choose. What we'll see in the demo notebook in a few minutes is that when we convert one audio track and try to get its MFCCs, it's actually a matrix with the number of rows representing the length of the track and the number of columns representing the number of MFCCs. So we need to like aggregate that further. And the methods that people use are just to take the mean and the variance of each column of each MFCC. And so um, by just kind of taking the mean and variance of each MFCC, that's one way of, I guess, summarizing the raw MFCC data. Although deep learning models can use the, the actual matrix of MFCCs themselves, but other models, we kind of need to compress this a little bit, especially when we do dimensionality reduction. So what we end up with is a data set of columns for, I'm just representing them here as like the mean for each MFCCs because I didn't have enough slide room, but we have two columns per MFCC. One is the mean and the other is the variance. And so we wind up now with these feature encodings. So in the previous project, we had one hot encoded the data to arrive at our encodings. But in this project, we're using these audio features and we arrive at these feature encodings. And these represent the, some data about the song qualities. I ha, there's a lot in there. I just want to pause and see if there's questions. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, what you may want to listen to, too, the other day I was going to pick up my son, and on NPR they were having a segment on a lawsuit with Ed Sheeran and another guy named Ed Ayers or something. They're suing each other over 
qualities of their songs, like a copyright infringement. But it's really <laughs> interesting. And they were getting into like, what does it mean to take a part of a song? And it like can be a background layer of like a yeah. thumping sound that you wouldn't pick up. Like they played it to me and I could not hear the similarity between the two, but then they stripped off all the other stuff and you could hear like on the fifth layer down. And I guess the MFCC could automatically pick some of that stuff up. It was interesting. It was on NPR. If you do like NPR music lawsuit, it was on three Ed days Sheeran. ago. Ed Sheeran and Ed Bobby Ayers. Um, yeah. It was really, I never knew like That's the, thing. the thing. And there's people, they gave the name of the profession of people who study this. Uh, that this aspect of music and definitely makes sense to me. I mean, like the hip hop world and especially the EDM world, man, there's, there's people who come up with just the background layer, the beat, the underlying bass and, and basically the rhythm section of a song, uh, drums and maybe a bass line. And they definitely like, like that is the song. Like they generate those and then they go find an artist to rap over the beat. And so like, you will be like, your job is the beat artist. Hmm. And there are people who are just incredibly good at that. And they come up with really catchy hooks that some other artist will, you know, rap over. And that's the collaboration that makes them successful. And um pretty sure that's like the whole Dr. Dre and Eminem thing. Um that he was sort of the an underlying artist and then Eminem would provide the lyrics. But that makes sense. And there it's a lot more clear, like there's a distinct layer. It's kind of like the only layer, but um, yeah, yeah. It's just you might be interested since you're interested in this because they were talking about how far do the courts let them go? <laughs> because there's only so. I mean, can you say that you own a C flat? No, <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't say you the own the C flat at the <laughs> note level. But people are saying like, if you play these four these notes sequences. together, that sequence of four notes, I do own. Like, where do the courts draw the line? Yeah. How far do right. they let people chunk it? That's uh, that's going to get contention. Yeah. Yeah. So this kind of with... project was, like, made me think of that. Like, oh, they probably have people doing this for the lawyers, just out trolling to find who stole from who. <laughs> just lawsuits to keep lawyers busy. Um, yeah. Make good money, probably, because probably most of them get settled out of court. Oh yeah, I mean Ed Sheeran would pay millions to settle it out of court from the sure. Um, easy money, easy money. Yeah. Okay, you can go on, Mike. Sorry. Back up. Three. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, so yeah. So now we have these audio features, and as you can imagine, now uh, the next step is to um, reduce these features. And this is the same process. Um, I only use PCA so far. I didn't get to explore the other methods and that's something I could do uh, in the future but same same idea on dimensionality reduction we go from all these columns of audio features into just two or three however many we choose so now we could plot these on a graph so we would plot these on a graph and we might notice that certain songs are close to each other or um yeah, like certain songs by a given artist are close to each other. And if that is the case, then what we could further do is take the centroid of each song or centroid of each artist's songs. And here it's just depicting like uh, a point per song. But in a minute, I'll show you, we did this on like a point per artist. And this just helps like, helps kind of like cut down on the noise of having all these points all over on the graph. All right, so those are the methods. Now let's check out the results. Okay, so let's look at the methods demo notebook and and then and then we'll transition into looking at some of these results. So now we'll transition into a Python notebook that I set up to just demonstrate these methods. And I think it's cool because we're like processing audio oh great my notebook disconnected so <laughs> um let's see curse of the live demo yeah yeah so there's just some setup here and downloading <laughs> some packages and um i have some helper code as well 
and basically we get to choose a a video url from youtube and then kind of extract the video for it and now this actually can take a while it's really unfortunate that my notebook got disconnected because i'll have to like fetch the video again perhaps so this might not make for the most streamlined it has check mark though so it, maybe it's still there i don't know like yeah i ran it earlier i'm just going to try to leave this video part up because this is what is actually fetching this youtube video and it could take we could like try it like 50 times and be waiting here and it still could not work but i uh, prepped one of these beforehand and got this video so i'm just going to leave this cell and now like it was um, loaded yeah yeah, yeah. So hopefully we could just kind of move forward here. Um, you could also download the video. And so now we see that content downloaded into the collab file system, like the actual audio file itself. And in collab, we can actually play that as well. Hopefully. Hopefully. All right, so I'll, I'll play this entire track, which is four minutes and 32 seconds long. All right, yeah. Okay, cool. Listening to music in collab, very fun. All right, so we downloaded the, the song and we have the audio file here. And now we could try to process the audio file. But actually, we have to cut tracks first. So. Mm -hmm um here we see that the raw audio from that the librosa package gives us is just like a multi-dimensional array although it's just a one-dimensional array and it has a certain length to it but it will be variable length so when all we need to do is just chop up this list into equal length segments and so um that's this process of cutting tracks and so we choose the track length i chose 30 seconds and uh, now what we'll see is that we can cut tracks into 30 seconds. So this will be the first one. All right. And then it ends at 30 seconds and then the second one begins. All right, anyway, so we cut these tracks into equal length, uh, cut this audio into equal length tracks. And I think it's cool to just verify that hey we actually when we cut this audio up when we still listen to it it's a real thing so that helps me verify that like this cutting process worked properly all right and so um that's the nature so so now we can also pass one of those tracks or the entire song but we can pass just one part of the song, like that track itself, into some kind of function that will help us arrive at the MFCCs for that track. So this is just one track, and it has um, a lot of rows, and the rows are related to the length of the track, and the columns are related to the number of MFCCs. And so we have this like matrix of MFCCs, but we need to kind of aggregate that a little bit. And so that's why we take the mean and the variance of each. So then we can roll this up to just one row that has double the number of columns. Yeah. And so we could summarize these tracks now using not only the MFCCs, but also features like the tempo and these other ones that to be honest, I need to learn more about. <laughs> So the final audio features are now assembled for each 30 second track or three second track. And now we're able to kind of reduce this data. And so what you see here is this data is the audio features for one track, but I collected a bunch of tracks. And so I posted the data to GitHub and we can just load that data for the full data set. So here we see the entire data set of features including artists like Frank Sinatra and Taylor Swift and all those artists we looked at before. Mm -hmm. And um, in summarizing this data set, we see that with the 30 second tracks, we have um, 1800 rows 
for a total uh, length of 206 videos over 15 hours. And then this is like the, the roll up of artists that you saw in the slides, just summarizing the data set composition per artist, number of videos and total minutes. Now, all we need to do is run that uh, encoded data, the, the features through dimensionality reduction, and we choose the number of components. And so that helps us arrive at these plots of the reduced embeddings. And so now we can explore these plots. So that was the demo notebook, and you could try it out. I encourage you to copy that notebook, anybody who's watching, and, and choose your own YouTube song and, and, uh, and, 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 and explore a little bit. But what I'd like to do now to, to finish the presentation is actually explore these charts in, um, it, online. I posted them online. So in the presentation, you'll see these links. And let's look, take a look at some of these now. And we can explore together. Or I'll clear my previous exploration so we can now explore together. So I'd like to explore these components in 2D space to start. So we have the uh, we have this like artist filter on the right. And so we could start with like Beethoven, for example. And here are all the three second tracks from Beethoven. And so what we could see is that most of Beethoven's music is concentrated in, in this upper left quadrant, although there is some variety in this distribution. So to contrast Beethoven, let's choose like a totally different artist, maybe like Dr. Dre. Yeah. Yeah. So here we see that the that Dr. Dre's music is represented in a totally different area of the graph. And so this would suggest to us that the qualities of these two different artists are different. There isn't much overlap. Select but Alicia Keys next. Alicia Keys. Okay, I have some ones that I know look good. And then but Alicia yeah. Keys, let's see. Let's see. I'm just curious because she's classically she trained. Piano work in there, but yeah, because yeah. she's yeah. classically trained artist. Closer. That's interesting. She's like a hybrid of those two, which kind of makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Actually, kind of in between the piano and the hip hop, like in yeah. that in in between yeah. space. Cool. All right, live audience contributions here. <laughs> All right. So we'll leave Alicia Keys up there. She's taking up that middle lane. Jay Z to be around with Dr. Dre, right? Yeah. So let's take a look at Jay Z. We would expect. I would expect. Actually, uh, that also kind of makes sense because you're getting closer. I think the vocals are probably closer to like Alicia Keys, right? Yeah. Like and, I, sound and Dr. Dre are totally different. So he's got the underlying rhythms, probably the sort of rhythm similarities, but more vocals that are closer to Alicia Keys. <laughs> interesting combo there. Yeah. So another hip hop artist is like Tupac. And we see that over yeah. in this space as well. <laughs> And then finally, let's look at like Bach, which we would hope to see more in the Beethoven space. Cool, so Bach is up here near Beethoven. Mm -hmm. All right, I think it's so cool to look at these plots. <laughs> um, so that was, that's, that's all their tracks in three, these three second tracks, but um, there's a lot going on. So if we just now focus on the, the center, the centroid of each artist, maybe that will help us cut through some of the noise a little bit or just represent this in a different way. I mean, I also think the variance is really cool. Yeah, yeah, it is cool. Like, some artists seem to span a much greater space and some doing, like Bach is quite concentrated, which makes sense because he was pioneering, uh, you know, tonality in music at the time. I mean, he was like the guy who made the piano basically. And, and Beethoven expands it by adding more symphonic elements. And here we are, he's got an expansion of, of that. He's going off in that upper right, upper left, which is like just instruments that Bach never used probably. Uh, and then you get these hip hop artists that are spanning huge spans, like very, very broad space. Um, so it's interesting too, is years ago, I heard on NPR, um, he was a researcher in Iowa or something. And what, one of his areas of research was he looked at what people listen to 
And 85% of people listen to the same thing that they listen to in high school for yeah. the rest of their life. Yeah. 15% um, of people listen to new things. Yeah. But it'd be interesting to see, like, if you could predict what people would like or not like, which I guess is what Spotify is probably doing, is using this type of data to say, <clears throat> you listen to a lot of these upper left corners, so we'll feed you more upper left corner. Yeah. And we won't let you get introduced to new stuff because you don't want to be. I mean, it'd be great if they had a dial that said that, like allow me yeah. to you know, dial up how much variance I want in what I'm listening to. Uh, but uh, but yeah, people do tend to be highly influenced at that. That's pretty much puberty. I mean, it's basically like when you're hitting puberty slash just post post puberty and you're becoming an adult. It's a very formative phase of your life for a lot of things. A lot of your preferences get established there, and music preferences being sort of hardened there makes sense. Like with just development, so it's not not too surprising. But also very true. I feel like most people can. Uh, can affiliate with that. Like I, you know, what I listened to back then is kind of what I listen to now. <laughs> what I prefer now, it's not that different. Yeah, my wife likes the old, like the what we grew up on. And I listen yeah. to it, I'm like, oh, that is just so old. It's so old. <laughs> well, it's not just old, it's just not just good. Not good. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not a huge Taylor Swift fan, but her music is much better than Madonna's music. Okay, like, that's, and that's, just music wise, I mean, I'd rather listen to her music. Madonna's just isn't that I mean, it. come on. It's not that complex. It's pretty simple. <laughs> like a virgin's classic. <laughs> okay, sorry. Well, all good, all good. So just the final, yeah, just the final um, visual here before we, before I wrap up is just viewing the centroid. So it is cool, I think, to see the variance. Um, but if we try to cut through that a little bit, mm -hmm. now we can maybe represent an artist with a single point. And so here we see like Bach and Beethoven in this top left mm -hmm. quadrant, also like Andrea Bocelli in this area as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, in the right and bottom, here's our rap artist, Jay-Z, Tupac, Dr. Dre, and then also like Ariana Grande and Rihanna. And so I think that's interesting. And then in this middle region, there's maybe lack of differentiation. So maybe trying TSNE or UMAP could help uh, differentiate this a little bit. I think that's something for me to explore next, but it's okay. cool to, to see the, the culmination of this. Now what we could do is maybe just take cosine similarity for each of these points. And so if someone says they like Dr. Dre, we can say, all right, the closest point here is Tupac. You might like Tupac, for example, or you might like Ariana Grande, for example. And so that is how we could uh, leverage these results in a real life way. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. So I know we're coming up on time and that's it. That's all I have for my presentation, except for this final slide where I'll drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And thanks for all of your questions and participation as well. I think it was cool. A good discussion. Um, um, cool things there too about just instrumentation. I mean, it's what's really interesting is that it's based on the audio qualities, which is important. Like we talked about like Spotify and some of these other platforms are probably also using network information that just like these people tend to like the same things. And so we're going to bring in other things outside of just the sound quality. But this is purely just the sound, which I mean, you, you would probably also start to see some differences based on what, obviously this is like a demo, like a small sample here, but like Beethoven wrote piano concertos and so did Bach. And so if you, if you took just the videos of their piano concertos, they probably overlap quite a lot because it's the same, there's only one instrument, it's just the piano. Um, versus like Beethoven symphonies, that's gonna be distinctly different than a Beethoven piano concerto. And so that's maybe what you're seeing with that big burst around outside of Bach was Beethoven ripped open what you can do with their orchestra in a way that no one before him ever did. And that's a unique fingerprint that he has. Um, so just just what type of music? Like all the a lot of these artists, especially ones that have that big variance, it, it might also just be variance in the types of songs that they have produced. Right. And some artists span like John Legend and spans a lot of genres, and he does a lot of types of music. And yeah, also, if they have videos, he's got a lot of things going on. There. 
Yeah, also if there's some collaborations or remixes in the training data, like I just very quickly yeah. grab the top YouTube videos, but some yeah, of them might be sense. live, some of them might be studio. So yeah. they're more intentional, more intention into which videos are included in the training data set, I think could could be another benefit. Uh, but yeah, like uh, like collaborations and and live versus studio tracks. These are these could uh, contribute to the variation in a within a given artist as well. Yeah, because if you think of like Beyonce, she yeah. always has collaborations. Yeah, I mean, it's rare that it's just her. It's tons of variation in what she's produced. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, I wonder if there's also a way of looking at that, just like sort of looking at the the span of an artist and saying which artists are more internally self-consistent and yeah. produce um, versus someone who's spanning a lot of different types of music. But I mean, certainly for like a music recommendation algorithm, this is like, it seems like a very plausible approach. Of course, you have to have created these embeddings for every song in your corpus. So like Spotify has a lot of songs, <laughs> but of course that's, they're doing some version of this. I mean, to, make their own algorithms and but uh, but it's really cool to see actually how uh straightforward it actually is like it's i mean the amount of the the tool kit there is pretty impressive how well developed it all is you know all open source tools to just make this happen um very cool well and i think it gets to what mm -hmm. the issue like with the trustworthy ai component is do I want Spotify to create that algorithm for me? Because they will infuse it in things that gets me to listen to more of their ads. <laughs> because that's their business. Model. Yeah, yeah they want me to or subscribe. Or, or subscribe. Yeah. I mean, they'll have a different <clears throat> goal than if I can use open source and create, even if it's not quite as good, it's good yeah. enough to give me recommendations, but it's on my own. We we My talked about system. like yeah like an open open Spotify basically like an open version open source version of a rec music recommendation algorithm. The challenge, of course, is you're going to get into all these copyright issues. Like obviously, downloading these these music files from YouTube is sort of okay for a little demo. No one's going to come on our case. Uh, we'll post this to the web. Please, no one sue us. But obviously, it's it's just demonstrating it. But to make a commercial product that's an open source, yeah, we might get into some copyright problems where that gets taken down. Um, so, you know, how to put something like this into production. I think it would be really cool to have your own like Chrome browser plugin or something that allows you to have your own ad free open sourced, you know, music recommendation algorithm. Like that would be a really cool tool that definitely all the pieces of the tool are there. But um, well, I think yeah. even a more controllable one, like even if I think about yeah. chat GPT, oh. Yeah. Now that I've used the API, I don't like using the website because I have no control. Unlike stable diffusion, where they have all my bars, I can switch, I can add, change yeah. the temperature, I can change yeah, yeah. all the. If you use ChatGPT, you're just stuck with their preset settings. And the same is true with like the music algorithm on Spotify. If I don't get to control how much variability do yeah. I want, yeah. could you create something open source that would let people have more control? Yeah, over what's being recommended. Yeah, I mean, over I, and like, do I want to add more variation? <laughs> Maybe I am part of that 85% that listen to the oldies, but I don't want to be. So I want 5% to start including new things so I can expand my boundaries. That's cool. Could I have? levers to do that yeah like more it's customization more control yeah but yeah. yeah um very fun mike cool yeah, stuff. Fun stuff um i'm gonna go ahead and stop so i don't right. forget to stop the recording and we get good. four hours yeah so